Uh, Minister Mento, Mrs. Lee, Ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this dialogue session with Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew, MM, of course, as he's affectionately known, needs no introduction, especially to a primarily Singapore audience. But as it is somewhat discourteous for a chairman not to provide an introduction, please allow me to say a few words on MM. Now, the major accomplishments of MM are well known. He is the key architect of the modern miracle that is Singapore, probably one of the greatest living statesmen in the world, and certainly the most admired Singaporean globally. I can say this with great personal conviction since I've traveled around the world and heard praise of him in all corners. So what can I add in this introduction since anything that I say will seem rather paltry in the face of his global reputation? Let me therefore focus only on why MM is the most qualified person to address the issue of aging. First, even though he will turn 85 in September this year, as we all know, he remains very young in spirit. Indeed, a cabinet minister told me privately that MM has one of the youngest minds in the cabinet. <laughs> and he has demonstrated this by mastering new technology after he turned 80. His speeches are laced with references to technology. In his recent address to young PAP members, he likened Singapore to a hard disk drive and the foreign talent as the extra megabytes that enhance Singapore's functioning capability. But when I told my friends about how young in spirit MM was, they said this is why MM is actually not qualified to speak on aging, because he's still very young. Uh, second, all through his life, MM has remained remain open to new ideas and perspectives. When I was a foreign service officer, one of the greatest joys of my life was to attend brainstorming sessions with MM, both formally and informally. Even when he disagreed with my ideas, he would always encourage me to be candid and forthcoming. Very few people <coughs> can inspire this level of openness. And this explains why even though MM has lived through many different historical epochs, he's always been able to understand each epoch and steer Singapore through each one. But the third point is, however, the most distinguishing feature of MM. As a student of philosophy, I've always been intrigued by the conceptual differences between intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. Quite remarkably, I have met intelligent and knowledgeable leaders who have been unwise. Indeed, the older I get, the more amazed I am at how few wise leaders the world has. So in Singapore, we are truly privileged to have MM continually share his wisdom with us. And it now gives me great pleasure to call on MM to begin his opening remarks. Thank you, MM. <coughs> Thank you, Kishore. My concern today is, what is it I can tell you which can add to your knowledge about aging and what aging societies can do? You know more about the subject than I do. A lot of it is out in the uh, media, in the internet, in books. So I thought the best way would be to take a personal standpoint and tell you how I approach this question of aging. If I cast my mind back, I can see turning points in my physical and mental health. You know, when you're young, you're you didn't, I didn't bother. I assume good health was God-given and will always be there. When I was about uh, 57, that was, I was about 34, we were competing in elections. And I was very fond of drinking beer and smoking. And after the election campaign, 
in the Victoria Memorial Hall. We had won the election, the city council election campaign. I couldn't thank the voters because I'd lost my voice. I'd been smoking furiously. You know, take a packet of ten to uh, deceive myself. But I run through that packet just sitting on the stage, watching the crowd, getting the feeling, the mood before I speak. And I make, I make an average of three speeches a night. Three speeches a night, 30 cigarettes, a lot of beer after that, and the voice was gone. I remember I was on my, I had a case in uh, Kuching, Sarawak. So I took the flight and I felt awful. I had to make up my mind whether I was going to be an effective campaigner and a lawyer in which case I cannot destroy my voice. And I can't go on. So I stopped smoking. It was a tremendous deprivation because I was addicted to it. And I used to wake up dreaming that I, the nightmare was I resumed smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but I made a choice and said, if I continue this, I will not be able to do my job. I didn't know anything about cancer of the throat or esophagus or the lungs, etc. But it turned out that it had many other deleterious effects. Strangely enough, after that, I became very allergic, hyperallergic to smoking. So much so that I would plead with my cabinet ministers not to smoke in the cabinet room. They want to smoke, please go out, because I get allergy. <clears throat> then <clears throat> one day, I was at the home of my colleague, Mr. Rajaratnam, meeting foreign correspondents, including some from the London Times, a man called Louis Hearn, and they took a picture of me, and I had a big belly like that. <laughs> <laughs> a beer belly. <laughs> I thought, no, no, this, this will not do. <laughs> <clears throat> so I started playing more golf, hit hundreds of balls on the practice tee. But this didn't go down. <laughs> there was only one way it could go down, consume less, burn up more. Another turning point came when I was, this was 1976, 77, after the general elections, I was feeling tired. So I was breathing deeply at uh, the Astana and the lawns. So my daughter, who's uh, at that time just graduating as a doctor, said, what are you trying to do? I said, I feel an effort to breathe in more oxygen. So she says, don't play golf, run, she said. <laughs> Aerobics. So she gave me a book. Kind of, uh, quite a famous book, and then very current in America, on how you score aerobic points, swimming, running, whatever it is, cycling. I looked at it skeptically, but <laughs> I wasn't very keen on running. I was keen on golf. So I said, let's try. So in between golf shots while playing on my own, sometimes nine holes in the Astana, I would try and walk fast between shots. Then I began to run between shots. And I felt better. After a while, I said, OK, after my golf, I run. And after a few years, I said, golf takes so long, the running takes 15 minutes. Let's cut out the golf and let's <laughs> run. <laughs> I think the most important thing in aging is you've got to understand yourself. 
and the knowledge now is all there. When I was growing up, the knowledge wasn't there. I had to get the knowledge from friends, from doctors. But perhaps the most important bit of knowledge that the doctor gave me was one day I said, look, how is it I'm feeling slower and sluggish? Uh, this is Dr. Lee Young Kiat here. He's now retired. So he gave me a medical encyclopedia and it turned the right pages of aging. I read it up. And it was illuminative. A lot of it was some, you know, difficult jargon, for, but I just came through to get the gist of it. That you grow, you're born, you grow, you're your strength. You reach 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, then thereafter you're on a gradual slope down, physically. Mentally, you carry on and on and on uh, until, well, I don't know what age, but mathematicians will tell you that they know their best output is when they are in their 20s and 30s, when your mental energy was powerful and you haven't lost many neurons. That's what they tell me. So, as you acquire more knowledge, you then craft a program for yourself to maximize what you have, because that's common sense. I never planned to live till 85 or 84. I, I just didn't think about it. I said, well, my mother died when she was 74. She had a stroke. My father died when he was 94, but I saw him and he lived a long life. Well, his, maybe it was his DNA, but more than that, he swam every day and he kept himself busy. He was working for the Shell Company. He was in charge of, he was a superintendent of an oil depot. When he retired, he started becoming a salesman. So people used to tell me, I said, Look, your father is selling watches at BDP De Silva. In other words, telling me that's infradig for the Prime Minister and his father doing that. <laughs> <laughs> My father was then living with me. But it kept him busy. It can't be meeting friends. He's had the routine. He meets people, he sells people, he sells watches, he buys himself uh, all kinds of semi-precious stones. He circulates coins. And he keeps going. But at 87, 88, he fell, going down the steps from his room to the dining room broke his arm, three months, incapacitated. Thereafter, he couldn't go back to swimming. Then he became bound, wheelchair. Then became a problem because my house was constructed that way. So my brother was a doctor at a flat house, took him in. And he lived on till 94. But towards the end, he had gradual loss of mental powers. So my, in my calculations, I'm somewhere between 74 to 94. <laughs> and I've reached the halfway point now. <laughs> but have I? Well, at 1996, when I was 73, I was cycling. And I felt a tightening of the neck. Oh, I must be tired today. So I stopped. Next day, I returned to the bicycle. After five minutes, it became worse. 
So I said, no, no. This is something serious got to do with the blood vessels. Rang up my doctor, says, come tomorrow. Went tomorrow, he checked me. Says, come back tomorrow for an angiogram. I said, what's that? Says, he'll pump something in and we'll see whether the coronary arteries are cleared or blocked. I was going to go home. But an MP who was a cardiologist happened to be around, so he, he came and said, what are you doing? I said, I've got this. He says, don't go home, you stay here tonight. I've sent patients home and they never came back. <laughs> so just stay here, they put you on the monitor, they'll watch your heart, and if anything, an emergency arises, they will take you straight to the theatre. You go home, you've got no such monitor, you may never come back. So I stayed there. Pumped in, the die, yes it was blocked. The left circumflex, not the critical lead one, so that's lucky for me. Alright, so they blew it up. So almost normal. Two weeks later, I was walking around. Hey, I felt it's coming back. <laughs> yes, it has come back. It had occluded. So this time they said, we'll put in a stent. And the stent, and I'm one of the first few in Singapore to have the stent. So it was a brand new operation. Fortunately, there was a the man who invented the stent was out here selling his stent. <laughs> he was from San Jose, La Jolla, something or the other. So my doctor got hold of him and he supervised the operation and said, put the stent in. My doctor did the operation, he just washed it all. And then that's that. That was before all this problem about lining the stent to make sure that it doesn't occlude and create a disturbance. So at each stage, I learned something more about myself and I thought that, I said, oh, this is, this is now a danger point. So, all right, cut out fats change diet. When you see a specialist in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, he said, take statins. I said, what's that? That will reduce your cholesterol. My doctors who are conservative said, no, you don't need it. Your statin, your cholesterol levels are okay. Two years later, more medical evidence came out. So, so stick <laughs> statins. So, had there been no angioplasty, had I not known that something was not up and I'd cycled on, <laughs> I might have gone at 74 like my mother. So I missed that deadline. <laughs> so, next deadline, my father's fall at 87. And I'm very careful now <laughs> because sometimes when I turn around too fast, I feel as if I'm going to get off balance. So my daughter is a neuro neurologist and so took me to the NLI says, nerve conduction test. <laughs> Put electrodes here and there and so oh. The transmission of the messages between the feet and the brain has slowed down. 
So all the exercise, everything, effort put in, I'm fit, I swim, I cycle. But I can't prevent this losing of capacity of the nerves in this transmission. So just go slow. So when I climb up steps, I have no problem. When I go down steps, I need to be sure that I've got something I can hang on to just in case. So it's a constant process of adjustment. But I think the most important single lesson I learned in life was that if you isolate yourself, you're done for. The human being is a social animal. He needs stimuli. He needs to meet people to catch up with the world. I don't much like travel. But I travel very frequently, I, despite the jet lag. Because I get to meet people of great interest to me, who will help me in my work as chairman of our GIC, the pension funds, so I know I'm on several boards um, of banks, international advisory boards of banks, of oil companies and so on. And I meet them and I get to understand what's happening in the world, what has changed since I was there one month ago or one year ago. I go to India, I go to China. And that stimuli brings me to the world of today. I'm not living in the world when I was active, more active, 20, 30 years ago. So I tell my wife, uh, she, w she woke up late today, I said, and when you come along by 12 o'clock, <laughs> <laughs> I go first. If you sit back, because part of the, the, uh, the ending part of that encyclopedia which I read was very depressing. As you get old, you withdraw from everything. And then all you will have is your bedroom and the photographs and the furniture that you know, and that's your world. So if you've got to go to the hospital, the doctor advises you to bring some photographs so that you, you will know you're not lost in a different world. But you know, this is like your bedroom. So, I am determined that I will not, as long as I can, be reduced to have my horizons close on me like that. It is a stimuli, it is a constant uh, interaction with people across the world that keeps me aware and alive to what's going on and what we can do to adjust to this different world. In other words, you must have an interest in life. If you believe that at 55 you're retiring, you're going to read books and play golf and drink wine. <laughs> then I think you're, you're done in. <laughs> no, statistically, they will show you that all the people who retire and lead sedentary lives, the pensioners die off very quickly. <clears throat> so, we now have a social problem with medical sciences, new procedures, new drugs, many more people are going to live long lives. They will have, if the mindset is that I have reached retirement age 62, I'm old, I'm, 
I can't work anymore. I don't have to work. I just sit back. Now is the time I'll enjoy life. I think they're making the biggest mistake of their lives. After one month, or after two months, even if you go traveling with, a, with nothing to do, with no purpose in life, you will just degrade. You go to sea. The human being needs a challenge. And uh, my advice to every person in Singapore and elsewhere, keep yourself interested, have a challenge. If you're not interested in the world and the world is not interested in you, <laughs> the biggest punishment a man can receive is total isolation in a dungeon, black and complete withdrawal of all stimuli. That's real torture. So, when I read that, you know, I, people believe, Singaporeans say, oh, uh, 62, I'm retiring. I say to them, you really want to die quickly? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see sunrise tomorrow, or sunset, you must have a reason, you must have that stimuli to keep going.